Yeah, welcome back to The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. We're starting off with the big stories on the front pages of our national dailies. And to make sense of all of this, uh, we have our public affairs analyst, Mr. Ezekiel Ayato, a public affairs analyst, who will be joining us to make sense of all of this. But I'd like to start off with the leadership newspaper this morning. Looking at the front page of the leadership newspaper, the big story here says, one year after hashtag NSAS protests, police food drag on reforms. Uh, that's the bold story you find on the leadership newspaper. And that's on page four. Now underneath, police brutality continues amid attacks on stations, facilities. Over 20 police stations attacked and 47 officers killed in 12 months. Uh, that's quite sad if you ask me. Federal government state opts to fund capital projects with 350 trillion naira in five years. It's also another story on page four of the leadership newspaper. As you're looking at the leadership newspaper, you have power shift, a new twist, North Central backs nothing governors. Uh, that's on page seven of the leadership newspaper. Obasaki meets President Muhammad Buhari and six funding for ranches. It's also another interesting read on page, uh, page five. And you have PDP chairman, nothing leaders narrow down on who? Uh, find out on page six. All right, and let's move to the daily independent newspapers next to see what we can find. Big one there says, 2022 appropriation bill, reps urge cotton 6.45 trillion naira new borrowing. Want increase in oil benchmark to $60. Works allocation, 500 billion naira. It also says stiffer sanctions for airing MDAs on capital implementation. MDAs sabotaging Buhari's efforts to borrow, says Lawan. Also, Aisha Buhari converses increased uh, synergy between first ladies and media. Okay. Governor Ozodima demands additional states for the southeast. And also, Sunday Boho critically ill in Kotonou, lawyer cries out. Federal government to bar unvaccinated civil servants from work. And union indicts aviation ministry over Nigerian Eagles crisis. We can also find on the Daily Independent, Nigeria earmarks 350 trillion naira for capital projects from 2021 to 2025. And on the PDP convention, Ayu Shema Nazif Batu for chairmanship position, governor's route for Ayu. All right, let's quickly check out the Nation newspaper this morning. Uh, looking at the big story here, it reads, PDP chairman, North party leaders' consensus plan shaky. Uh, that's boldly written on the Nation newspaper this morning. Three geopolitical zones pick different candidate. Mark, Ghana, Idris, withdraw. Uh, that's also underneath the bold caption. You have Igbo who seeks nod for treatment in Germany or France. Uh, that's on page six. Uh, talking about Sunday Boho, six not for treatment in Germany or France. Uzodima renames Hero Square after Ndubisi Kanu and Senate invite workers or works ministry, others over foreign loans. Uh, I think that's what you find here. Uh, just before we move away quickly, you have COVID-19, November deadline for federal workers to get vaccinated or what? Uh, all of the information available on page four of the Nation newspaper. All right, and now to the Daily Trust newspapers. Federal government, private sector to bridge 350 trillion naira infrastructure gap. Uh, amount equals Nigeria's 18 years budget. States to contribute 20 trillion naira. And also plan will reduce huge debt burden, but also NNPC to rebuild failed roads. We can also find here a Pandora secret deal between Sambo Dasuki's family and billionaire contractor exposed. COVID-19, unvaccinated civil servants barred from work as bandits kill five soldiers in Zamfara. Mixed reactions as federal government moves to shut IDP camps. Still on the Daily Trust, Nigeria budgets 14.6 billion naira for suspended national carrier project in three years. PDP Chair Shema Ayu Nazif emerge as zonal candidates. All right, and uh, we'll say good morning once again to Mr. Ezekiel Nyaetok. Thanks for joining us. 
All Good right. morning. Always a pleasure to be with you every Thursday morning. Absolutely. L l let's start with the you know uh, conversation on the PDP chairmanship. Um, it, uh, certain names have, uh, of course, uh, crept up. There's uh, Shema, there's Ayu and Nazif, and of course, uh, a few others, I'm sure, that would also likely uh, give that um, a shot. You know, so share your thoughts on where that seems to be headed and what it really means uh, going forward with regards to uh, uh, a candidate for 2023. Okay, um, I, I think I'll talk about it ideologically because that's more um, useful to the nation. When, you know, I was once a national um, party chairman and um, the very first meeting I attended was when they were doing election and I decided to vie for the uh, vice chairmanship of IPAC. And they really think that, I mean, it was preposterous that I wouldn't have uh, more than one vote. Then there were 29 parties. But long story short, they made a mistake of giving me just five minutes to say something. And I made a very simple statement that every party is government. Every party is government. You are either government in action or you are government in waiting. When you understand that as a party, that every party is government, then the leader of that party has to be somebody who understands what government is, what governance is, who sets up the dynamics of the party to be able to give either the real government or the shadow government so that, like APC, by the time PDP gives way and you come in, you come in and you the tire just hits the tire and you, you, you hit the ground running immediately. As at today, what determines who will PDP pick as their chairman? Is it a good politician or an administrator that will reposition the party to move governance from politics to governance? What is the consideration? Incidentally, we don't think governance, we think politics. So they are looking, going to look for that man who can, you know, uh, muster whatever it takes for, for them to, to remain in power, as good as that is. But that man must be able to give PDP a vision and a direction as they move into 2023. He has to be able to communicate his game plan to be able to inspire confidence in the electorate. They need to be very careful because the role of the party chairman is coming at a very, very crucial time. Somebody who is going to have to get into the driving seat, hit the ground running, and inspire confidence in the new Nigeria that we all desire. Nigerians right now are fed up with APC and PDP. And PDP have a very great opportunity right now for them to make a statement to Nigerians that, look, this is a, a new improved PDP, and whoever they choose as a party has to be charismatic, has to have the uh, capacity to communicate, has to be somebody that is relatively trusted, has to come with a vision that he will communicate forcefully because he's going to be a chief campaigner for the party. If they do not take these considerations into cognizance and just think of, will play their game, they will so lose that they will hate the day they were born. That's, that's um, what I want to say concerning that. Okay, uh, let's quickly look at the leadership newspaper this morning and, and looking at the front page, the bold story talks about uh, the hashtag NSAS protest. It's almost a year, of, of course you say it's a year already, and uh, the reason for that protest was mainly asking for a reform in the police sector. I mean, uh, let there be uh, reforms. But one year after, nothing seemed to have happened, I mean, as regards, uh, you know, the reforms here. What do you really make of that? You see, our administrators, the very first mistake they made, thinking they were trying to be smart by half, was to try to change the narrative. The narrative was not that of frustrated young people getting down and looting and destroying as they tried to make end stars to me. It was very, very, very articulate young people, extremely articulate, for the first time, making a very specific demand and ordering themselves in the most organized manner ever 
in the history of this country, as I can remember. They not only were extremely peaceful, but they even would sweep the place and pack the place, you know, of all the dirt. They didn't go co collecting money from people. They contributed money. They had a point to make. And they were making that point so forcefully that we, uh, the, 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 the people in power, seeing that they were getting, you know, uh, embarrassed, so to speak, decided to play the game that they are very good at by sponsoring hoodlums to come and infiltrate and cause. And then they wanted to change the narrative to be that of these young destructive people they have come again. That was not the story of NSARS. The story of NSARS should be written and rewritten. And because they, re they refuse to understand the story of NSARS, they have refused, in my personal opinion, to come up with the solution that these young people required. Let the police stop harassing, intimidating. The police are supposed to be those that help to maintain law and order. The police are supposed to be people that the, the society has so much confidence in that they will bring up any information that is against the interests of state. And who do they go to? They go to the police. Let's reform the police to become people who are very trustworthy, people who the, the citizens have a lot of confidence in, people who understand the young people and understand that this is the tech age. Let the police understand what cybercrime is. Let them understand what technology is. Let them understand that every young person is supposed to be encouraged to have you know, a laptop or a, a smartphone to be able to play in the fourth revolution that has already kicked in. Instead of seeing you with a laptop and immediately branding you as, um, you know, a 419er or these uh, Yao Yao boys and things like that, let them set up a system, an ecosystem to isolate the bad and encourage the good because the way forward for Nigeria is education and technology. Okay. When you do this, we have a police that enjoys the confidence of the young people. We can then isolate the criminals and then we can move forward. What a beautiful story to tell and what an opportunity we are seemingly missing. That well, is a story. As a follow-up to, follow to that discourse right there, what could there be, I mean, what could really be responsible for the brutality that the police force is really facing? According to reports here, over 200 uh, police stations have been attacked and uh, 47 officers killed within this period. Could it be uh, that it's because of the lack of reforms or what could be responsible for all of this brutality, which is not really, I mean, it's not acceptable, if you ask me? Nigeria is a very interesting country. Nigeria is a country where you don't have leaders that care about the people. Nigeria is a country where we have leaders that don't mind causing problems so that they can have their way. They don't mind sponsoring thugs to take away ballot boxes so that they can disrupt the whole system and do what they want to do. The time has come when we need to know that we need to isolate the goat and the yam. We need to know what is driving politics, what politicians want. We need to come to that conversation because some of the things that are happening just don't have a logical explanation. Before you can have the boldness, the effrontery, the audacity to move into a certain police station that is in the center of the city, you need to be either so sophisticated or you know that it is an insider job, nothing is going to happen. Some of the police stations that have been burnt and the way they've been attacked, I mean, let's get cerebral just a little bit. It beats him. You know, crime has a certain standard it operates globally. Crime has a way. For instance, once there is a place that there are cameras, people are likely to be a little careful on crime. Okay? But when you know that there are cameras, you know there are cameras. And then you brazenly go to commit crime, knowing that you should ordinarily be captured by the camera. It's either because you know that that camera is shut down so that there's an insider job before time, or you know that, I mean, 
your guy is the one sending you, so nothing is going to happen. There's going to be a beautiful explanation as to how Nepal took light or how it was fault. You know one thing or the other. I think that what is going on in Nigeria today is that the good people have stayed back and the political hoodlums have seized the state. And they are doing a lot of uninteresting things. I don't believe that any young person, I've, I've related with the young people almost all my life. Go back to my Facebook pages for 20 years ago, 15 years ago, you will see a consistency. That's why I was able to be called in to give the young people a party where I co-founded the Young Democratic Party and was the Pioneer National Chairman. Nigerian youth are not recalcitrant. They are not complacent. They are not unpatriotic. If anything, it is Nigerian youth that are giving Nigeria the good image today. Go to sports, it's Nigerian youth. Go to fashion, it's Nigerian youth. Go to Nollywood, it's Nigerian youth. Go to music, it's Nigerian youth. And these are the things that are giving Nigeria positive image abroad. And these people are not even backed by government. Nigerian youth are very, very patronizing. They are very, very patriotic. They are very, very, you know, together. We need to redefine our understanding of the Nigerian youth. But we must stigmatize them. We must call them all sorts of names so that we can have reason to isolate them from governance. Yeah, That's why we don't take our responsibility to transfer to the youth. Yeah, so, so so we can, you know, also cover other stories. You know, sadly, you know, this, you know, police and youth conversation may never end. Um, and of course, you know, it, it reaches into the need for police reforms that the Nigerian government doesn't seem interested in. And at the same time, you know, how can the young people even force the government uh, to reform the police force, you know, if the government itself is not interested in reforming that police force? So it's, it's, it's a tiring conversation, you know, but of course it's important. Uh, but let's move on to other things, you know, and that's infrastructure. Now, one of the stories um, that made headlines across the papers was a plan for a 350 trillion naira investment in a um, capital project. It says on the Daily Independent, top uh, left corner, Nigeria earmarks 350 trillion naira for capital projects from 2021 to 2025, which sounds very interesting. Uh, but, you know, I'm not sure if we can actually pull this off, if we even have you know, any uh, way that we can source the funds to pull this off. So, um, Senator, talk, share your thoughts on that one. 350 trillion yes. naira. That is yes. way, way more than our national budget um, has ever been. 18 years national budget, more like. I I I'll tell you one, two, three things. Number one is that when you talk of infrastructure, there are two components to it at the very least. The very com first component is the cost um, of the project. How do you arrive at the cost of any project? That's number one. The second aspect is the implementation dynamics of that project. Because you can have a project that is well costed, so to speak, and yet in the implementation, you don't bring round pegs to round holes, and as a result, you, you mix them up. And unfortunately, we are, we are losing on both counts. Now, when you go to PPP, which is a private-public partnership, the, the, the government networking with the private sector so that they don't need to bring all the funds in, but they kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, leasing out or having an understanding where you can either build or operate before you transfer or just something that brings in the private sector, you realize that Government does not need to bring all the funds. A very good example I can give you right now is an estate that I am involved in, I'm doing with the federal government in Uyo. In that estate, the Senate committee came in and declared it the most interesting, the best estate they've seen in the country so far. How did they arrive at that? The federal government did not put a dime, a cobble in the construction of that estate. They just provided the land and basic infrastructure, and that estate is fully built. Now, what that means is that if we had the cost of infrastructure and land at, say, $2 billion, and then the cost of the construction at $3 billion, that makes it $5 billion, the federal government only brought out $2 billion, whereas the other $3 billion came from a completely different sector. Now, that is the way to go. Now, they had a choice of going to borrow a complete $5 billion to be able to put that estate up. So, 
in looking for two, 350 trillion, it has to do with you thinking outside the box, not thinking contract alone, but thinking how you are going to be able to get the work done, sincerity of purpose. A PPP, this PPP should not be like the China PPP that you have where we are told that the, 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 the laws are written in Chinese and we just are shown where to sign. You need to be very, very patriotic. You need to be result-oriented. You need to come to a point where you know that you are result-oriented. When that is done, it is possible for us to borrow that amount of money, but not with this present government. No, not. Nigerians need to come to think of electing a governance system or set of people that are not just patriotic, but have competence, character, and, of course, capacity. When these people come in, we can borrow 300 trillion into Nigeria and then we will be able to repair the whole thing because every project is properly costed, not just properly costed, every project is handled by the most competent people. So the result comes in on time, the user is there and then the derivatives come out and are used to repay the loan. It is possible but the current government does not believe in cerebral governance. They believe in political governance. Political governance means co collect the money, run your election, leave your tenure, leave the loan. Whoever comes in will take after that. They don't care about the next generation. They only care about the next election. So this government should just stop where it is. Just manage where we are. We won't die. At the end of 2023, Nigerians have a responsibility to bring on board people who are thinking governance and they understand the dynamics of governance, they understand the place of patriotism, they understand the weakness of the system and strengthen it. When that is done, we can borrow as much money and every fund is like me going to the bank. Banks give me loans, I refuse to, or to take them because I'm not, I know I'm going to repay. I'm looking at the loans, I'm looking at the conditions, and I'm looking at how much I really need. If I need 300 million, I'm not going to put 350 million. All right. The politics says bring as much as you can. Okay. Uh, just before we let you go now, quickly, we'd like to share your thoughts on this. Sandy Bohu has been diagnosed with kidney issues, and he's asking that he'd like to be treated in France or Germany. Uh, how do you think that the government in Benin Republic should respond to this? Number one, Government in Benin Republic, they have specialists. They do have. If they don't have, which I, I will hate that, they can hire. Get appropriate specialists to go through his medical records and undertake the necessary examinations. If it's what you can handle, handle it. If it's beyond what you can handle, it is better to allow the man to leave and lose the case, so to speak, than to let him die in captivity because you do not want him to escape. That's why the law says it is better for 20 criminals to be set free, we are not sure, than for one innocent man to be convicted wrongly. So for here, we are talking life. If that man does have a condition, it is not rocket science. Medical science can tell the stage if you have cancer, if you have kidney problems, whatever it is you have, they can diagnose properly the stage you are in. They also know their facilities. If their facilities are good enough, make it available to the man, but give him the very best possible treatment. Don't let him die because you don't want him to run. If there's need for him to go out, let him go out. If you lose him alone, it is better because... The the the, 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 the the implication, the repercussion, better still, of him dying in prison is worse for the government than him uh, being let on compassionate grounds to go for medical treatment and he escapes. I think the government of Benin should be a lot more strategic in their thinking. All right. I think we can wrap it up here um, um, so we don't uh, take too much time. As a Kelly and I talk, always interesting hearing your thoughts on uh, major stories making headlines. I wish you a very Thank interesting you, Thursday. Ahead. Thank you. Many and to my sister. Thank you so much for being part of the conversation. Nice we appreciate you. your time. Thank you.
Thank you. All right. Stay with us. Uh, we'll take a short break. When we come back, uh, we'll be sharing with you what happened on this day in history. And we're going back all the way to 1964 to talk about a very popular name and something that happened to him on this day. We'll be back.